World War II, the Empire Strikes Back of World Wars. It seems like World War II would be a pretty natural fit for Doctor Who. It's probably the most dramatic, the most cinematic wars of the 20th century, one of the rare wars with even a semi-clear line of who the good guys and bad guys were, and it was an important war for Britain especially, both in terms of the stakes and in terms of the country's patriotic image. To have Doctor Who stories in this time period seems natural, but it actually doesn't happen as often as you think. The first time a Doctor Who story took place during World War II was The Curse of Fenric in season 26, aka the last season of Classic Who. And even then, it wasn't about the Nazis or any of the Axis powers. It was about a Soviet commando squad trying to steal a supercomputer from almost Alan Turing. New Who is where most of the World War II adventures take place, but again, you'd be surprised how little it happened. The Ninth Doctor had a two-parter visiting London during the Blitz. The Tenth Doctor actually never had one. He skirted the edges of it, hung around a Depression-era shantytown in New York, met Agatha Christie, but never actually stepped foot between 1939 and 1945. The Eleventh Doctor is when the floodgates finally opened. You had Winston Churchill meeting the Daleks. You had River Song running rampant in Berlin. You had whatever the Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe was supposed to be. And the Twelfth Doctor, well, he has yet to step into World War II. That's only five television stories in the show's 53-year history that take place during the war. I was surprised it was that few when I started writing this. It just, again, seems like a natural fit, like it should happen all the time. Well, Dix thought so too. So for his first original Doctor Who story in eight years, he jumped into the deep end and had the Seventh Doctor rub shoulders with Hitler. This is Time Worm Exodus by Terrence Dix. The Time Worm Saga is an interesting beast. A four-book arc about the Doctor chasing a singular adversary, with each book still being a somewhat self-contained adventure. There's precedent for it. It harkens back to things like the Key of Time arc in Season 16, where the Fourth Doctor was tasked with finding parts of a dangerous artifact, and every place he looked offered its own unique adventure. And of course, the Trial of a Time Lord, which, um, was a thing. But those were seasons shaking up the formula well into the property's timeline. The Time Worm Quartet is kicking off a new series that ultimately isn't made up of sectioned off miniseries. There would be story arcs after this, sure, but after Time Worm and the three-part Cat's Cradle, which is barely functional as a trilogy, they weren't sectioned off like this again. And in reality, there's nothing special about the Time Worm books except for their titles. Peter Darvel Evans didn't have some grand Babylon 5 story worked out. He had a loose idea as to what the Time Worm was, and that was about it. It was up to the authors to communicate with each other and try to get on the same page, which they really didn't. When it came time to write the second book in the series, Terrence Dix only had access to the very last chapter of Time Worm Genesis, which I suppose is the most important chapter since that's the one where Ishtar takes the name of the Time Worm, but if you wanted some kind of unifying theme or idea between the four books, you're pretty much out of luck. So without much of an artistic vision, or even an effort to guarantee that four books written by four different authors even work well together, why bother with a Time Worm arc in the first place? This is purely speculation on my part, but in 1991 there was still a lot of rumors about Doctor Who returning to television. It hadn't been off the air a full two years yet, and many fans were still holding out that this was just an extended hiatus, and we'd be getting back to Adventures in the TARDIS real soon. If not from the BBC, then perhaps from an independent company buying the rights, which was actually a real possibility in the early 90s. At the same time the Virgin New Adventures was kicking off, Doctor Who magazine was reporting that Shepard Studios, a British film studio, was gearing up to help produce a science fiction television program in 1992 a show that sounded like it could quite possibly be a Doctor Who revival. Either this project was dropped wholly, or reports were just getting confused with the studio's production of the fifth season of Red Dwarf. In any case, it didn't happen. 
but it could have happened. And if Doctor Who returned, there really wouldn't have been much of a point in the Virgin New Adventures. It couldn't act as an official continuation of the show. The BBC would probably have bought back publication rights, as it would with the Eighth Doctor Adventures, and the New Adventures would have come to a screeching halt before it had even really gotten started. Again, I'm speculating. But Time Worm might have been a way to package the books as a singular product in case Doctor Who did return. Which sounds better? Oh yeah, The Virgin New Adventures, that aborted book series that was immediately made irrelevant? Or, oh yeah, Time Worm, that four book series that held us over during the show's hiatus. Of course, as time went on and it became clear that Doctor Who wasn't coming back for a while, Virgin New Adventures could drop the miniseries idea. Which is good, because they were kind of bad at it. I don't mean the individual books in Time Worm are bad, we've already gotten through the only one I would consider bad, but they aren't all that great as an interconnected miniseries. Time Worm Exodus and Time Worm Apocalypse opts to hide away the Time Worm, keep her as a minimal background character so that the authors can just tell the story they wanted to tell from the very beginning. It's especially hilarious here. The introduction shows the newly formed Time Worm flexing her new time and space powers, and she runs across some guy in Earth's history that interests her. She chose one man, bitter, neurotic, a failure in all he had attempted, but with forces of hatred and resentment inside him that matched her own. One single atom in all the seething masses of humanity. How amusing to use that atom to destroy the planet. It was easy to enter his mind, slipping between the synapses of the brain like layers of microcircuitry slotting between the valves of a primitive wireless. It was easy to enter, but once inside. As she explored the mind's potential, she found that although primitive, it was unbelievably powerful. She felt her energy levels being damned, her circuits inhibited, her powers fragmented. In sudden panic, she tried to wrench free and found herself held fast. She was trapped in the mind of a madman. Yes, Time Worm spends the entire book trapped in the brain of Adolf Hitler. Which still sounds like a story, but she can't really do anything for the majority of this book. Instead, a whole second group of aliens show up, totally unrelated to the Time Worm, and this book concerns itself with what they do. So, the plot. The Doctor and Ace are chasing the Time Worm through the Time Vortex, and that leads them to London in 1951. Only this isn't normal London, no ma'am. This is a London from an alternate history where Germany won World War II. The entire country is occupied, its citizens under German law, those fit to work sent to work camps building up coastal fortifications. King Edward VII, aka the Nazi sympathizer of the royal family who was king for like a minute, has returned to the throne, and Sir Oswald Mosley, the man who founded the British Union of Fascists in 1932, has been made Prime Minister. Clearly someone's been mucking with time. The Doctor suspects this is something other than the Time Worm. The Time Worm is into destroy and conquer. Whoever did this did it with a more delicate and precise touch. They clearly need to fix this, but they don't know how or when time was changed, so they need to learn this alternative history without drawing attention to themselves. Of course, we're talking about a man who wears a jumper covered in question marks, and a young woman in a bomber jacket carrying around a backpack full of homemade explosives. They draw attention to themselves. There isn't any central creative figure for Doctor Who. There's no equivalent to a George Lucas or a Gene Roddenberry, somebody with an authoritative stamp over collaborative work. And that's for the best. Doctor Who wouldn't have been Doctor Who if it ever tried to restrict itself to any one person's idea as to what it should be. Hell, even when the show started back in 1963, the show's original creator, Sidney Newman, insisted that the show would have no bug-eyed monsters. Which producer Verity Lambert immediately said, uh, nope, and the Daleks were created. I'm certainly not here to raise Terrence Dix to this pedestal. He almost certainly wouldn't want to be considered a creative figurehead, and has fully embraced the ever-changing nature of the show. Seriously, whatever criticisms I have of his work, Terrence Dix is among the most pleasant and accommodating people ever to be involved with the franchise. I can watch his convention interviews for hours, 
even if he does get asked the same six questions over and over again. Still, if you were to make a list of the most important people to Doctor Who's production, I think Terrence Dix would easily make the top five. Terrence Dix was born in 1935 in Essex. After studying English in college and a two-year stint in the British Army, Dix took up a very lucrative job as an advertising copywriter, and probably could have made a career for himself there, but he also had a side hobby of writing radio scripts and submitting them to the BBC. He got himself involved with other creative types, including Malcolm Hulk, a television writer who had written a handful of pre-Doctor Who children's science fiction serials, many of them produced by Sidney Newman, and was getting involved with another Newman joint, The Avengers. Yeah, there was this fun spy show in Britain called The Avengers, and that's why Marvel's The Avengers was always called Avengers Assemble over there, so the locals couldn't confuse them with the TV Avengers. Anyway, not the point of this video. Hulk brought Dix on board to assist the Avengers scripts, and that segued into Dix getting a steady job writing for the soap opera Crossroads. One of the other writers on Crossroads was a man named Derek Sherwin. He and Dix used to take the train to work together. Sherwin left the show to become a script editor of Doctor Who during the second Doctor's run, a time when the show was starting to struggle. Scripts weren't coming in on time, Patrick Troughton was in talks of leaving, the ratings were down, and the budget just wasn't there for all the weird alien locations the Doctor kept winding up in. There was serious talk about the show getting cancelled after its sixth or seventh season. So one day, Sherwin called up Dix and went, um, so this ship is sinking fast, how would you like to be script editor of Doctor Who? So Dix came on board when the creative forces were in a mad dash to keep things afloat. And to top it all off, the second Dix came on board, two planned scripts fell through. To help replace them, Terrence Dix grabbed Malcolm Hulk and the two of them went into overtime to whip up an epic 10 episode story to wrap up the second Doctor's run. This story became The War Games. The War Games is actually pretty relevant to this book, so here's a quick summary. The Doctor discovers a planet consisting of weird zones where different wars from Earth's past are being reenacted by the actual soldiers who fought in them, pulled out of time by a human-looking race known as the Warlords, who want to collect the winners of these simulations and use them in their personal intergalactic armies. Not sure why Survivor of the Mexican Civil War qualifies you to fight in space battles, but whatever. The Warlords are assisted by a rogue Time Lord called the War Chief, who gives them the time travel technology needed to pull off the scheme. The Doctor managed to turn the Warlords and the War Chief against each other, the Warlords shooting the War Chief dead. Despite this, the Doctor can't stop the Warlords or return the soldiers to their proper times, so he winds up calling the Time Lords to help marking the first time the Doctor's own race is mentioned by name or appears on television. The Time Lords swoop in, put the Warlords on trial, and execute their leader, known simply as THE Warlord, by wiping him out of existence, making so that he never existed in the first place. I already touched on Dick's career with the show and... Oh, shit. Now, I already touched on Dick's career with the show and his later period writing the majority of Target's novelizations in this series introduction. I would highly recommend watching that if you haven't already. Time Worm Exodus was the first original Doctor Who story Dick's had written in eight years, and would be his first time writing anything for the Seventh Doctor. Dick's never novelized any of his stories. Terrence Dix certainly didn't have contempt for this version of the character like John Peel had, but I get the sense that he didn't quite understand this iteration in fullness. In an interview with Doctor Who magazine, Dix says, I've seen some Sylvester McCoy shows and I got the Curse of Fenric video to get a feel for him and Ace. Which suggests he might not have gotten a large enough sample size to really have a firm grasp on this character. Though, if you're going to write a Doctor Who story set in World War II, watching the only other Doctor Who story set in World War II is probably a smart move. Anyway, there's no hint that Dix understood the idea of the Times Champion, or the questions that were being raised about the Doctor's backstory, but you know what? That's okay, because Dix does the smart thing here. Instead of forcing it, Dix defaults to something I call the Core Doctor. The Core Doctor is made up of all the elements of the Doctor's character that are consistent between each generation. While a lot of changes with every regeneration, such as temperament, favored ways of solving problems, and the odd hobby, there are still ideas that are consistent between each incarnation. 
Ideas like a strong sense of justice, a general disregard of authority, a passion for the unknown, and especially relevant for this book, the ability to take control of a situation and become the most important person in the room. Someone coming. I guess if you own the place. Do what? It always works. We own the place. Doctor! The Doctor does this a lot in this book. And it's super fun to read. Dix is great at writing the Doctor in this mode. Here's an early example where the Doctor approaches two Nazi youth harassing a street vendor. Hand over the cash, you lousy kike. It will smash up the stall in you as well and turn in what's left to the Racial Affairs Bureau. Ace lunged for the tough holding the little man over the counter. Again, the Doctor held her back. We heisen see! he shouted in a loud, harsh voice. The youth let go of the little man and swung around in amazement. He stared blankly at the doctor. We heisen see, Domkov! bellowed the doctor. Stepping smartly forward, he slapped the astonished youth full across the face. Ace looked down in amaze as the doctor delivered a second slap, a backhander this time. It was a solid blow with all the doctor's unlikely strength behind it, and it rocked the youth on his feet. He staggered, and blood trickled from his nose. Er, uh, began the second youth uncertainly. The back of the doctor's hand smashed him across the mouth. Say still! He rolled back to the first victim. Namen! Look, I'm sorry, muttered the youth. We don't speak German. So, perhaps it is well. The doctor sounded like every Gestapo officer in every old war movie Ace had ever seen. The German language would be polluted by the lips of such scum as you. Your names and your units! He marched up to the first youth, stood on tippy-toe, and screamed to his face, Stand to attention when you address me! The two lads snapped to a clumsy form of attention. Sidney Harris, said the first. George Brady, said the second. London unit, British Free Corps. So, said the doctor, icily calm again. And what are your standing orders as regards to this festival? Just keep an eye on things, said Sid Harris uneasily. Watch out for subversive behavior, signs of disorder. Exactly. And do you see any sign of disorder here? Once again, the doctor's voice became a terrifying screech. Apart from which you have created yourselves? White-faced and quivering, Sidney and George were too terrified to speak. You will return to your unit, said the doctor. You will report to your superior and place yourself under arrest on charges of attempted extortion. His voice rose again. Now move at the double. Ein, zwei, ein, zwei. To Ace's amazement, the two young men turned and ran, disappeared between the pavilions at a stiff jog trot. The first half of the book is this little adventure in alternative history London, where the doctor bluffs his way into a position of power, convincing those in charge that he's a German official doing a secret investigation on Nazi security. Everybody seems to buy it except Lieutenant Hemmings, a rather proud young officer who is brought to almost slapstick levels of ruin when nobody else believes him that these two are trouble. This may be a bleak timeline, but damn it, it's fun. We have a lot of pulpy fun bouncing around the awful police state. We've got interrogation scenes, chase scenes, we've got the doctor dressing like Colonel Clink, complete with monocle. There's a scrappy underground resistance made of pleasant homebodies. There's a ratty little informant you'd love to hate. There's a murder most foul in the foggy London streets. And Hemmings just can't catch a break. The goal here is for the Doctor and Ace to discover the point in which time was changed and the Nazis won World War II. They don't get any kind of exact date, but they do pick up a few clues. Seems Adolf Hitler was involved with an occult society called the Black Coven, and the Time Worm is hanging around somewhere. The Doctor is attacked by her telekinetically while investigating an old museum. So the Doctor and Ace get found out, there's a few more chase scenes, and the pair manage to escape into the TARDIS. However, before they leave, Hemmings has a rather mysterious encounter. Not far away, Hemmings too was hurrying along the dimly lit corridors, wondering why the whole area seemed to be empty. Usually there was patrolling guards, prisoners being delivered or released, dead or unconscious bodies being dragged away, the grim sounds of interrogation. He shot round a corner and stopped in amazement before a strange blue box. It was the doctor's box, the one his men had fetched from the festival site. The box should be locked away in a storeroom, but it wasn't. It was here, and the door was open. A voice was calling to him, inside his head, like a sleepwalker. Hemmings walked up to the open door of the box and went inside. The door closed, 
and the box faded away with a strange, wheezing, groaning sound. This isn't the real TARDIS. What is it, and what happened to Hemmings? We'll find out in two books' time. So we get to the second half of this book. The Doctor makes a quick stop at Munich in 1923, where baby-faced Adolf Hitler is making an attempted coup, an event that would be known as the Beer Hall Putsch. Or as anime fans might know it as, that thing that was going on in the background of Full Metal Alchemist Conqueror of Shambhala. The Doctor is here for one thing, to get Hitler to owe him a favor. The coup has gone bad, some people get hurt, some people get killed, and the baby Nazis are forced into retreat. Hitler's shoulder gets dislocated and the doctor pulls him to a building and helps set it. Ace is kind of disgusted that the doctor is being so nice to Hitler of all people, and even tries to kill him at one point, because you can't have a time traveler not try to kill Hitler. But the doctor instead gives Hitler an encouraging speech, telling Hitler that he'll be a very powerful man someday, and that the doctor will return for him when that happens. Man, if I ever get a time machine, I'm going to make sure every world leader in history owes me a favor. Hell, just to cover my bases, anytime I do anything nice for somebody, like bring in their groceries or help jumpstart their car, I'll make sure to go, Remember me, for in 15 years' times you shall repay the favor. So, we've been having a lot of fun so far, but now we get to Nuremberg in 1939, when the Nazis are at the height of their power, and this is when the book starts to get problematic. Whereas the first half of the book was alternate history pulp, this is when we really start to dig into real history, the real people who did real bad things to other real people with real implications. There's still a good dose of sci-fi weirdness, especially near the end, but Dix clearly did his research on this. He knows his timelines, he knows all the important players, and he knows the good places to weave in science fiction elements. And Dix was certainly aware of the sensitivity of these issues he was presenting. He was especially concerned about how he characterized the more powerful members of the Nazi party, all of whom the Doctor ends up crossing paths with, some of whom seem rather charming under the circumstances. Here's what Dix said about it in the same interview with Doctor Who magazine. That was a great moral dilemma. Despite everything I hate about Nazism, there's a perverse glamour about it. It's like enjoying Al Capone stories. We're more likely to pick up a book about violent gangsters than one about Mother Teresa. They are fascinating, a gang of crooks and misfits who should have fizzled out. How did they make it? You never saw a more useless lot of villains. Fiction has a very interesting relationship with Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. They're one of the few real life groups of people that's pretty much okay to ridicule, make fun of, insult, because they were clearly evil and don't deserve respect. I'm not all that worried about hurting a Nazi's feelings, you know? We've been goofing on Nazis since they were in power. Hitler's run afoul of Charlie Chaplin, Captain America, and Daffy Duck. We don't really flinch if you have to kill Nazis in a video game or if action heroes gun them down. But the flip side to that is that the atrocities committed by the Nazis were no laughing matter. The Holocaust remains the greatest human tragedy in living memory. Which is not to say that I don't think it can't factor into genre fiction, but when it does, it needs to be handled with a delicate hand. Example, I don't think opening the first X-Men movie with a concentration camp was a bad idea in of itself. I think it could have worked, but the rest of the script wasn't really smart enough to justify it. It's tricky. It's very easy to fall into unintended consequences. Easy to be writing a Nazis as pulp action villains and accidentally step into Nazis as actual human monsters. It's very easy to get your wires crossed, and some people are going to react negatively to that. I mean, recent example, Captain America, a character created during World War II by Jewish artists, being an agent of Hydra, an organization that, retroactively, is tangentially related to the Nazi party. I personally am okay with this story being told, though it does look pretty corny, and I do think those trying betrayal are overreacting. But it's also clear that with so many moving parts, and so many of those parts related to World War II and the Nazi party, it's easy to fall into unintended consequences. Here's the point where Dix makes his misstep. Well, it's always been a bit of a mystery to me. What has? How the Nazi party came to power in the first place, said the doctor patiently. What's so mysterious about it? They were just ordinary politicians, weren't they? Have you any idea what they were like when they started out? A broken down drug addicted ex-pilot? 
a failed chicken farmer, an unsuccessful snob of a champagne salesman with a fake title and a ratty little lecher embittered with a club foot, a gang of total deadbeats led by a paranoid failed art student. A shrugged. Like I said, politicians. Amazingly successful ones. One minute they're only one jump ahead of the law, next thing they're running the country, and before you know where you are, they're in control of half the world. Well, I suppose if you put it like that, Ace wasn't really convinced. To her, all politicians were weird and slightly suspect anyway. Why would the Nazis be any different? It's always struck me as a bit of a historical oddity, said the doctor. Another one of the peculiarities of your peculiar little planet. I've been meaning to look into it for ages, but you know how things pile up. I always thought they might have had a bit of help somehow. Now, the doctor is clearly reflecting Dix's own thoughts on the Nazi party as we saw in that interview passage. Dix is, or at least was, genuinely amazed that the Nazi party ever became a thing. But I think making that amazement into an actual plot point here was a mistake. So remember the war chief? Turns out he survived getting shot, though he suffered something called an aborted regeneration, turning him into a weird multi-limbed monster. He actually kind of looks like the spider monster Dr. Smith turns into at the end of the Lost in Space movie. He gets back with the warlords and convinces him that, oh, this was all just a big misunderstanding. Let's collab on another project. How about instead of doing our weird useless scattershot methods, we focus on one highly motivated group of people and build them into Earth's greatest power, and we breed them into super soldiers, and that's how we get our army. We also have the warlord's son, who looks just like his dad, which, um, actually, he, he shouldn't exist, right? His dad was wiped out of existence entirely, meaning he never existed to make Junior here. I guess nepotism is such a big thing for the warlords that they'd rather render you into existence than post a jobs listing. So the war chief came to Earth, picked Adolf Hitler and his band of misfits, and started getting them in line. His big contribution is a psychic amplifier used every time Hitler gives a speech, which forces Hitler's emotional state onto those listening to him, making him persuasive even if he isn't really saying anything intelligent. Ace and the doctor get to sit through one of these. It was like magic, said Ace. Black magic. You saw how he started off, totally unimpressive? Ace nodded. If he'd gone on like that, he'd have been booed off the stage at a brownies meeting. Ah, but he didn't, did he? He suddenly kicked into overdrive. And can you remember what he actually said in the speech? Not really, just a lot of vague warnings about Germany being in danger. Who from? I don't know, Jews, communists, capitalists, foreigners, the Salvation Army, Little Green Men, everybody. Exactly. And can you remember any plans or policies? Anything specific he was going to do about all this danger? She thought hard. No, just a lot of stuff about blood and soil and the sacred spirit of the Aryan race. There you are then, said the doctor. He rambles on about unknown dangers looming from vague enemies and makes misty appeals to some hazy spirit of a race. All airy fairy nonsense, but you saw the effect it had. Ace nodded. I even felt it. Somehow he's bypassing sense and reason and logic altogether and broadcasting basic signals on the psychic wave band. Fear, hatred, paranoia. Then togetherness, reassuring, group feelings, massive chunks of raw emotions pumped out with enormous power. One of Terrence Dix's more consistent problems throughout the wilderness years was that he loved his own material. A lot. All of his books between 1991 and 2005 either feature characters and concepts he created for the show, or they feature characters and concepts he created in books that also feature characters and concepts he created for the show. It's not uncommon for a Terrence Dix book to feature the warlords, his version of vampires, or sometimes even both. Part of that has to do with the weird way the ownership of characters and ideas work, something I will definitely get into more detail in a future date. But Dix does strike me as a guy who really loves his own ideas. So take Dix's feelings about the Nazi party coming into power being massively improbable, and combine that with his desire to get the war chief and the warlords back into the game, and we end up with a book where every Nazi atrocity is Terrence Dix's fault. There's a world of difference between aliens show up and help the Nazis win World War II, and aliens show up and help the Nazis be Nazis in the first place. And the book didn't have to do this. The original mystery was 
how did the Nazis win World War II, not how did the Nazis get the idea to be Nazis. And this book isn't downplaying the Holocaust either. Ace runs into a ton of anti-Jewish propaganda, and the Doctor is forthcoming about the historical facts. You're meant to take that stuff seriously, but at the same time, it's really these alien guys who are to blame. Dix really wanted to do Raiders of the Lost Ark and Schindler's List at the same time, and it doesn't really work on a conceptual level. But to his credit, Dix does his best to minimize the problematic elements here. He's very clear that the anti-Semitism is a human product, something that was taken advantage of by the warlords, but not something created by the warlords. But at the same time, the Holocaust wouldn't have even have happened without the warlords' resources. It downplays the human race's capacity for evil. And when you put as much effort into the details as Dix does, you probably shouldn't do that. Also, it kind of complicates the Doctor's relation to this conflict. There's kind of an unspoken but largely agreed upon rule that the Doctor will gladly help the human race against alien invasions or freaky science anomalies or the odd monster, because that's something outside of the Earth's wheelhouse. But when it comes to human evil, to human issues, to human atrocities, the Doctor mostly stays out of it. The human race has to learn its own lessons. It has to solve its own problems. That's part of the Doctor's characterization, but it's also a way to prevent that awful disconnect when fictional heroes deal with real-world tragedies. You remember all those superhero comics that came out after 9-11? The weird emotional disconnect of costume heroes crying over real, horrible destruction? Wait, is that Doctor Doom crying? D Doctor Doom? You kill innocent people all the time. What are you doing? But by making the Holocaust something made possible by aliens, doesn't the Holocaust become an alien problem and therefore become one of the Doctor's problems? If 12 million people lost their lives due to extraterrestrial influence, you would think the Doctor would step in and try to stop it. There's really no benefit to this decision to have the warlords behind everything. You downplay real tragedy while making your hero seem heartless for not stepping in. You just can't win. And that's too bad because pretty much everything else about this book is great. It ends just as fun as it began with the Doctor and Ace getting chased by zombie Nazis through a medieval castle with Frankenstein equipment all over the place. And the Doctor manages to extract the time worm from Hitler's brain using a lamp and suckage setup that's basically just Luigi's Mansion. The book goes full EC horror comics and it's a load of fun. This book is fun. I know some people don't like terms like problematic favorite, but Time Worm Exodus feels like a perfect example of that. Unlike Time Worm Genesis, the problems are not surface level. On a surface level, it's 70% fun pulp adventure and 30% well-researched historical fiction, and all of that is great. Terrence Dick's core doctor is fun, the secondary cast is well-rounded, the action really moves, and there's one of the most perfectly executed Chekhov's gun I've seen in a long time. It's just the implications of its plot are unfortunate. But I fully believe they were accidental. Dix doesn't shy away from the atrocities of the Nazi parties, I just don't think he fully realized what he was doing when he shifted the blame to his also-ran aliens. It's a big mistake, but one I find I can live with as long as it's acknowledged. With that in mind, I would recommend checking out this book, especially if you enjoy alternate history or World War II fiction. Next time! We finally leave Earth behind as the Doctor and Ace chase the Time Worm to a planet of gorgeous people. It's a perfect utopia, so of course it has to have a deep, dark secret.